It's a very great pleasure to see all of you here today, some of our, many of our current students and many old friends as well. It's really a delight um, to get together for this, the 20th reunion of the certificate program, um, somewhat fewer years for the master's program, but it's a wonderful opportunity to celebrate um, this program, and we are particularly lucky to have Nancy Dubler, um, its uh, co-founder, come and give us comments. Um, Nancy will step up in a moment and we'll give our keynote speech. After that, we'll have three alums of the certificate program talk about their work in bioethics and how the certificate program has played a role in that. Um, and then we'll have a question and answer session, which will be moderated by um, Lauren Flicker. So that's the sort of overall plan for the day. Um, and of course, after that, most importantly, we have a reception right outside, um, in which case you can still get to talk to all of your buddies and make uh, new friends and say hello to the old ones. So I'll just say uh, for a minute or two, a couple of thoughts about um, bioethics in these last 20 years. Um, I'm, the, I'm the last of the original faculty who's still involved on a day-to-day -day basis with the certificate program. Um, and so this program has had a really shaping um, and very central uh, role in my career over these last 20 years. Um, I was away for a few years in Japan, but even so, this has really been the most consistent um, theme and th sort of thread through my work. I don't have profound thoughts, but I will tell you a few things that I hope you'll keep in mind. One, to the first approximation, bioethics is not about the technology. The technology, of course you need to know something about it, but it's essentially a shiny object. It's a distraction. There will always be a new shiny object, whether it's ECMO or dialysis or some new thing we haven't seen before. What bioethics is about is the old stuff, the old questions, your values. Who's in charge here? Who gets to make the decisions? What is the definition of dignity for this patient and for this family? What constitutes a life worth living and who gets to say um, whether or not that is appropriate for this particular person? And who pays for all this? Those are all really old questions. A case in point is the article that I was sent three times yesterday from the New York Times, which I'm sure many of you saw, is about the oldest question of all. It's nothing to do with technology. Can you cause other people not to feed you by mouth when you are no longer in a condition to take care of yourself? So can you set up a set of circumstances when you're not only saying, I don't want medical treatments, I don't want this, I don't want resuscitation, I don't want a ventilator, I don't want a feeding tube. Can you also say, even if I, in my confused state, accept food, can I write a document that says, you may not give it to me? It's not about the technology. It's about relationships between people. Can you cause a professional, can you cause some person you, whose identity you don't know today to take on the burden of not giving you food when you, in that circumstance, actually would like it? I think, for me, it raises really interesting issues. Your autonomy, where does it start, where does it end? And what obligations can you impose on other people unknown to you in the future? Particularly, I'm thinking a lot these days about dementia. And dementia requires a lot of care, a lot of hands-on care. A lot of care that's going to be supplied by people who probably won't get paid well, who, um, who will be doing a great deal of backbreaking work, and the notion that this army of caregivers can be told what you think about it doesn't matter, just doesn't come up, um, I find profoundly troubling. So for me, this really raises questions about autonomy and how far it should go and what your understanding of a relationship of the person who receives that wish. If you can send them an order, I don't understand why you can't send them empathy and some kind of relationship. What is the obligation? Is there something that goes two ways here? I don't know, actually, but I don't see those issues raised in the current discussions. But in either case, <laughs> those are really old questions. It's really not technology. 
So I, I leave you with that. Um, I'll note quickly in passing, we have other events that will help celebrate our 20th anniversary. You may have seen on the table on the way in, we're going to do a play reading on March 16th that is designed to be a fundraiser um, to raise uh, tuition, raise scholarship um, for tuition for the certificate and master's program. I think it will be a really fun event. There are flyers for that that are out there. Um, I also want to note in passing all of the wonderful faculty then and now who have been with us. So um, 20 years ago, we had the program started by Nancy Dubler and David Rothman. Original faculty were John Aris, um, myself, uh, Baron Lerner, and of course, Rita Sharon. And all, the, all of those people sometimes still connect with us. Um, later, we had Jeff Bluestein. Now we have Gina Campelia, who I think will, oh, uh, Gina and fascinating companion, are in the back of the room, um, having just joined us, Gina and Agnes, right? Uh, baby Agni, uh, Aggie are in the back of the room. Um, we have had um, Elvin Ikoku do narrative, and now we have Danielle Spencer. I just saw Danielle right there. Um, and we have uh, Lauren Flicker, who's our assistant director. And I feel like I'm leaving someone out, and I don't intend to. Adrian, Adrian, who is uh, the farthest gone uh, from us, um, but Adrian Ash wonderfully um, lent us her erudition for many, many years within the program. So um, we think of everybody who has been with us, who has made the program better. Um, and now I'll turn over to Nancy Dubler, who is uh, our great keynote speaker for today.